Hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming to my completion talk. Uh, I will be able to talk to you live uh, during the question time, uh, but now let's uh, start with the presentation. So the title of my talk today is the same as the title of my PhD thesis, um, 10 smooth and aspect expressions in Nafsan from a typological perspective. So let's start with the research questions that I had uh, in the beginning of my research. What can other described languages tell us about properties of closed linguistic categories? This was the most basic question I started with, and I soon enough focused on, on oceanic languages. And I asked myself, what insights can oceanic languages bring into debates about the cross linguistic validity of TMA categories? And uh, as I progressed in my research, I focused even more because I looked um, with um, I, I looked more specifically. Um, into Nafsan and uh, into categories that languages um, of that region have. Um, and I decided to focus on the debated categories of perfect aspect and uh, the realis-irrealis distinction. Uh, and by focusing on Nafsan, I could enter into both of these debates because um, Nafsan has been described by Nick Tiberger as having both the perfect aspect and the realis-irrealis distinction. Uh, I will talk about this in more detail uh, in, the, in the rest of my talk. Um, so the findings uh, relating to these research questions are that the perfect aspect in Nafsan and several other oceanic languages that I looked at um, actually has the semantic definition that is equivalent uh, to the perfect aspect in English. Uh, and it is not, um, it is not related uh, to some newly proposed categories um, of the languages of the region. Um, in particular, uh, I'm talking about the category of yamatives that have, has been proposed by Olson for several Austronesian languages as being a new kind of perfect, uh, a category that has slightly different uh, properties, but in some ways resembles perfect aspects. So I will show it my, uh, based on my research that uh, actually, in the oceanic context, um, we find evidence against proposing this uh, new category, and we should stick to the, the traditional perfect aspect. Um, and the second uh, finding I had uh, was that the realis, uh, the big finding, is that the realis, the realis mood, um, uh, when it is expressed by portmanteau subject markers, as it is in Nafsan, one of the two paradigms can be semantically underspecified. And in this context, uh, by assuming this reanalysis, we actually explain some of the unexpected behaviors of this um, modal category. Um, and uh, we also, this reanalysis can also explain um, why uh, we find certain um, mismatches uh, between different languages, why in some languages realis or irrealis can have different properties than in others. In part, that is due to uh, the semantic underspecification of one of the categories uh, in some languages. So let's turn now to the methodology. So how did I um, how did I investigate these questions? Um, so first, I relied mostly or in the beginning of my research. I relied uh, heavily on the previous work done in Afsan uh, by my supervisor. Um, and in particular, this is the grammatical description by Nick Tiberger and other published work. Um, and um, most significantly, the corpus in which I could look up all the relevant um, uh, constructions. Um, and so uh, on this map, you can also see where um, Efate uh, is uh, situated uh, in the larger Pacific, uh, South Pacific uh, region. Um, I also did my own field work. Um, I elicited uh, targeted semantic structures uh, of either perfect or and several others, um, several others tense aspect mood um, meanings by using storyboards. Um, I used storyboards that were created in our project uh, at the Humboldt University in Berlin uh, by Kilo von Prinz. Uh, and uh, last year I also used some of my own storyboards that were uh, informed uh, by previous elicitations um, and were targeting very specific uh, Nafsan structures. Um, so the fieldwork that I did uh, uh, was in Erakor, um, that's situated really close to Port Villa on the island of Efate. Nafsan, as such, is also spoken in Pango and uh, Eratap. 
Um, besides storyboards, I also used questionnaires, uh, and these are mostly DAL questionnaires. Uh, there's also the Olson questionnaire uh, that relates to this category of Yamatives that I mentioned, and Veselinova, and of course, other kinds of metalinguistic elicitation. And all of this is archived in Paradisic. Um, so just to give a brief introduction uh, into the structure, uh, linguistic structure of Nafsan, um, so in this table you can see uh, the template of the verbal complex of Nafsan that is based on um, Nick Tiberger's uh, analysis. So first we have the subject uh, proclitics that attach, so they mark the number and person of the subject and they attach to the following tense mood aspect particles. Um, and uh, then we have a lot of other elements that are all optional. Um, so auxiliary verbs, um, and so the ones that I put in the table are just um, uh, just examples. There are many other um, auxiliary verbs or uh, TMA particles. And then we get the negation, benefactive phrase, uh, the verb, and we have uh, two post-verbal slots for the perfective marker and for the negation marker. Um, so what is interesting here is that the only obligatory element in this uh, table is the subject proclitic and the verb, of course, um, and everything in between is optional, um, although some of the tense aspect uh, particles uh, are really essential to transmit certain meanings, and uh, I will also be arguing, arguing that that's the case for perfect uh, that is expressed by pe. So in this slot of the subject proclitics, uh, we have uh, three paradigms, actually. Um, so uh, here I'm showing the, the subject proclitics the way I an reanalyze them. Um, so I call this uh, paradigm the general paradigm, uh, but in the brackets you can see uh, the label that was given by Nick. So this was called the realis um, uh, paradigm. Um, then we have the irrealis paradigm that I maintain uh, with the same name. Um, and then we have the third paradigm that has been called perfect by Nick. Um, but I reanalyze it as perfect agreeing, and I'm not going to get too much into that uh, in this talk. Uh, but um, basically, the idea is that these perfect agreeing uh, proclitics do not really seem to behave like perfect aspect themselves. They only do so when co occurring with um, this uh, P marker. Uh, so in a way, they really depend on this marker to get that meaning when they occur alone, which is extremely rare and uh, it's probably being lost in the new generation of speakers. They do not seem to have any perfect meanings, uh, but they tend to occur most of the time with the pair marker. So um, that is why I treated them like that. Um, okay, so uh, what is like, what is the more, more general methodology of my work? Um, well, I combine methods from both semantics and typology. Uh, so when it comes to Nafsan, um, what I really wanted to find out um, is to create a fine-grained semantic analysis of Nafsan data regarding these uh, two categories, in particular, perfect and realis irrealis. Um, and for that, uh, in terms of semantics, I used uh, theoretical explanations of perfect aspect and realis and irrealis. Uh, which are mainly based on the formal semantic approach. Um, so in this case, uh, I was using a very different framework for, from um, the second one that I combined it with, which is a typological approach, where I looked at several other oceanic languages, um, and I used analyzing uh, pub usually published sources of these languages um, in order to strengthen specific arguments that I made based on the Nafsan data. And I chose them based on the linguistic features they had, the features that I was looking at, which is perfect aspect and realis and irrealis. And um, in this case, I could only look at published grammars and articles and uh, corpora whenever they were available, as in the case of Unua. Um, so uh, I focused on uh, Melanesian languages in general, uh, but I also looked at two Polynesian languages for perfect aspect. And for the perfect aspect, I also use the methodology of semantic maps. Okay, so now uh, the rest of this talk is divided in two big parts. Uh, one part is perfect aspect, uh, and the second part is realis and irrealis mood. 
So let's get let's get on to the reasons for studying uh, the perfect and the debates surrounding this category. So there has been a recent interest um, in um, in typology in particular when it comes to the connection between the meaning of already and the perfect aspect. Um, and that has been uh, done by Olson uh, in his master's thesis and uh, Dahl and Wehrli, uh, who claimed that um, this new category called the amative um, develops um, as a consequence of an intermediate diachronic stage between the development of already into the perfect aspect. So, uh, but regardless of the diachronic uh, scenario that presupposes that already is the, um, the origin of perfect aspect, uh, also in his thesis says that yamatives are a new gram, so a new typological, new cross-linguistic uh, category um, that should uh, describe uh, some perfect-like um, meanings. Uh, not all of them, uh, but additionally, the, the most crucially, uh, with an additional meaning of change of state. So, uh, in my research, I actually argue that uh, the categories of perfect and already are sufficient to describe the range of meanings that we find in languages, and also that um, there are other semantic tools that we can use uh, that are sufficient and we can use them to describe behaviors uh, that might not be consistent with the traditional um, uh, description of perfect aspect. So I will be talking about these uh, three tools. Um, one of them is aspectual coercion. The second one is paradigmatic blocking. And the third one is meaning compatibility. Um, I will talk about them a bit later. So let's first um, see what are, the, what are the available meanings or readings of uh, perfect in English. Uh, because English has been so far, and even in the typology, it has been used as the most prototypical instantiation of perfect aspects. Maybe not prototypical in the sense that other languages have it, but um, that it represents this category the best uh, for, yeah. Uh, so let's just assume that. And um, these are the readings that um, linguists in general agree English perfect has. Um, so we have the resultative meaning, that is something like John has arrived. Uh, experiential, John has been to Paris, um, universal, for example, John has been living in Paris since 2006, uh, hot news um, refers to meanings of recent past, uh, like John has just arrived, and the last one is anteriority readings um, that are expressed by past and future perfect, and they differ from present perfect because um, they, uh, they situate the event and the um, as the interior compared to uh, the event um, co uh, that is considered in the time that we are talking about. So, for example, when I entered the room, so this is the time I'm talking about, uh, John had already left, so prior to that um, event, the event of me entering the room. Um, and in the client framework of uh, present perf uh, of perfect in general, uh, he uh, illustrates um, this area of uh, present perfect as post time. So we would have the event of arriving. For example, John has arrived. Uh, so this is the event. But then what perfect does is that it refers um, to the time right after that event. Uh, and that's uh, what perfect refers to. Now we'll have a look at the semantic map that I have created for this typological space of perfect, already, and presumably yamatives. Uh, so uh, the semantic map method um, means that we are mapping different uh, cross-linguistic functions of these categories in a way that is showing their, their semantic closeness or their relation um, means that they're more semantically uh, close to each other, more semantically related. And at the same time, what we're trying to achieve is that we don't simply connect all the meanings to each other because that would be that would not be able to create any valuable predictions. But predictions here um, are supposed to capture the fact that in some languages we find uh, these two uh, meanings coming together and then these two which are further away and so uh, that is um, what we're trying to achieve with this uh, method. And so in this case I mapped the perfect meanings uh, here uh, as we can see in blue and then um, in yellow we see the meanings of already. And so these are the functions of uh, change of state and expectedness. 
And the change of state uh, would be uh, something like the meaning, um, like, let's say, uh, the baby is already big. Um, when used with a state implies that there was a change of state. And um, the fact that we use already also tells us pragmatically, it's usually analyzed as a pragmatic inference that that happened earlier than expected. Um, and so this is the meaning that perfect does not have in English. Um, but curiously enough, uh, what I try to show here with the um, yellow dotted line is that um, already it does combine with almost all perfect functions. So we can easily say John has already arrived or when I entered the room, John had already uh, left or things like that. Um, so that is what makes it particularly tricky to figure out whether the marker we're dealing with in an underdescribed language um, is in fact perfect or already uh, so what is the core meaning of that um, of that marker okay so what are the main problems for the cross-linguistic validity of the perfect aspect and maybe you, you already have some hints given that our best so far is to study english perfect so uh, the first one is that perfects in some languages lack some of the core functions of perfect. Some core functions would be, for, for instance, uh, anteriority or experiential or universal, uh, any basically hot news, right? Um, because the core functions are considered to be the, the English uh, perfect core functions, okay? So, uh, and then some languages also have additional functions when it comes to the perfect aspect in comparison to the prototype, of course. And one of these additional functions is the change of state function that has prompted the creation of the Yamitic category that can be identified by lack of experiential, universal, and anteriority readings and the presence of an additional change of state meaning. And this is what I mentioned already. My hair is long now versus my hair has been long, which would be the perfect reading. And the first one would be the, um, well, either Yamitic or already reading depending on um, uh, on your hypothesis. So what are yamitives and uh, which languages are said to have them? Uh, so in Olson's thesis uh, he identifies several languages in Asia and um, Southeast Asia that have uh, the particles that correspond to what he calls yamitives. So for example in Indonesian Sudak would be one uh, yamitive. Um, uh, he offers the, the example of uh, a rotting fruit uh, as a type of predicate that would typically take yamatives in the languages where uh, they occur uh, because it denotes um, a change of state and then yamative is said to denote that meaning. So you would have something like you can't eat this fruit, it is rotten, and you would have to use sudah in Indonesian and in Mandarin Chinese uh, the particle le, uh, would also be a yamative in the same context. So um, coming back to my semantic map, uh, what uh, what area would yamatives cover in the semantic map? So judging from the also uh, definition, we would consider uh, yamatives as corresponding to the area of the resultative meaning plus the meaning of change of state, um, and optionally the meaning of expectedness that he identifies in some of the languages, but not all of them, and to different degrees. And this is the meaning that I have also found in my research to be highly dependent on the discourse context and not so much, not necessarily related to the particles in question, but that's um, that's another topic. <laughs> uh, so uh, the languages that I looked at, of course, are Nafsan, uh, that is spoken on uh, Efate, um, and then I also looked at Unua, spoken in uh, Malakula in Vanuatu. Um, I looked at uh, Toabaita, uh, spoken in Solomon Islands, Nguyen and Ma Maori as uh, two Polynesian languages. Um, so the way that I um, elicited um, the data about perfect aspect in Nafsan consists of elicitations through the methods of questionnaire and storyboards. So the typical methodology would be to so I would do it like this. I would uh, first use the DAL questionnaire that has very specific context, but they require translation from English. Uh, so you can see that in the example number four, uh, you would have a particular context set up in English and then um, the speaker is supposed to translate it into their language. Um, and the translation is supposed, the effects of translation are supposed to be minimized by using these uninflected forms in English. 
Um, but of course, uh, that is uh, sort of limited and it only allows for working with um, a couple of speakers or maybe only one in my case uh, or two if I was lucky. So I, whenever I obtained evidence for certain meanings like experiential or resultative, I then constructed storyboards um, which were targeting these contexts in a more um, uh, in a more clear way. So storyboards um, basically contain pictures that uh, fall, have a sequence uh, that is uh, meaningful, have a story that uh, sort of uh, sets up the context in a richer way, and then the speaker uh, is presented uh, with with a story uh, that is said uh, in a meta language. In this case, that was Bislama. Um, and then without looking at the text, the speaker says the, um, uh, the story in their own way and uses whatever naturally comes to them. So this way I could uh, capture these constructions with more speakers um, and get more evidence for these types of meanings. And one really surprising aspect, so first, so I showed you a uh, perfect pe in Nafsan um has uh, the meanings of uh, experiential uh, we already saw resultative i will also uh, show that it has uh, other meanings but one that was really surprising and really really similar to english perfect um, is the fact that it does not co-occur with temporal adverbs um, as if the context is such that the present perfect meaning is intended even though there is no uh, tense in afsan right so uh, let's look at these two examples. Um, in the first one, uh, we have the context from the DAL questionnaire. Uh, we ask someone at 9 a.m., why do you look so tired? And the person says, I woke up at four o'clock this morning, right? So here we see that the topic time, so the time the utterance is about is four o'clock. Um, and in this case, you cannot say, uh, you cannot use perfect. You can say, I have woken up at four o'clock. You have to use the general proclitic. But if the context is richer, so if you were supposed to wake up at 5, if you set your alarm for 5, so that becomes our new topic time uh, in the sense of this uh, Kleinian framework I showed in the beginning. So that's the, the time that we are talking about in the context. Uh, but by chance, it happens so that you woke up at 4 a.m. Um, and this is our event time or situation time. Uh, and so in this case, we get the, actually the reading of past perfect, um, or with the corresponding meaning that will be past perfect in English. And then we can say, Kaipe pilo, uh, four o'clock pupong. So we could say, uh, in English, we could actually have uh, the translation as, I had woken up at four o'clock in the morning. So we see here that the restriction with temporal adverbs is the same as in English, which is that temporal adverbs do not co occur with present perfect, but they're fine with past perfect. And this tells us that even in the tenseless language, which is contrary to some things that have been said in the literature, even in tenseless languages, this restriction can um, can happen. So because the tense is computed from the context and we know uh, that the present uh, perfect meaning is the default one or the intended one in the example number six. And from the context, it is clear that the past perfect is the intended meaning in um, the example number seven. So we can see here that this is strikingly similar to English. Um, and if we look at, and um, I realized by looking at the nafsan uh, that basically nafsan, uh, the nafsan marker P ticks all the boxes um, that the English perfect does. So we have it, a resultative context, anteriority, experiential, universal, um, but we also have it in these change of state meanings um, that were associated with already and the additives. We sometimes get it with these expectedness readings. And um, we also have these restriction, restrictions with temporal adverbs, which means that it behaves just like English perfect. And the duality readings that I will not uh, talk about now that are also restricted. So they're not uh, a clear plus. Okay, um, and I looked at other languages. So the markers um, Na'a into Abaita, uh, Ju in Nunua, uh, Kua in, in Yuan and in Maori. Uh, and these languages seem to behave uh, strikingly similar to Nafsan. So they all also have the change of state meaning, um, which is really particular for this region. Uh, but then they also have all these other perfect meanings. So they do not behave like typical yamitives. They don't just um, take up this um, this area, more or less, would be the yamitive area, right? Uh, change of state, expectedness, duality, maybe resultative. But they actually have also anteriority readings. So the meanings of past and future perfect 
the um, experiential readings and universal readings, which are said by also not to fall into the area of yamatives. But what is what is um, uh, the point here is that if yamatives are defined by the existence of change of state, and if the, ch the meaning of change of state could not exist with perfects, then we would not expect that the change of state can still combine with all these other typically perfect meanings. So there is something strange here, right? We're either dealing with a perfect or we're dealing with a hybrid category, or maybe we need a new, a new category for this. But I'm going to argue that we're still dealing with perfects. Um, well, to the extent that I can know about other languages than Nafsan, but specifically for the case of Nafsan, I argue that. Um, and here we have an example of the change of state meaning. So, Malfani um, Maluk Hipetar. Uh, this is from a storyboard where I was specifically eliciting uh, the context in which um, this happened, where a girl dyed her hair, so it became blonde. My hair is blonde now, so there has been a change of state with this marker. marker. And if we compare it to a case where we just use a general subject proclitic, then we don't get that um, inter interpretation uh, necessarily. So we, ha we would have a case like, you look at that stone, that stone is big, and then we would just say itop, uh, right? That would be like the most default um, meaning of this subject proclitic. Okay, um, so what is really interesting here is that other languages um, that um, that do not have change of state morphology, so like they do not have derivational morphology to indicate specific change of state, are noted by Kunzgar Borden as um, having th these different kinds of effects when it comes to the meaning of change of state. And he notes that a lot of these languages use perfect to derive the meaning of change of state, especially when it comes to property concepts or um, like, I would say, verby adjectives right? or verbs that have property meanings. Um, and so his analysis of this is that uh, these languages, in fact, have states, so big and white in uh, Napsan, Tar and Top, would be states, um, but they're especially coerced into changes of states when um, when it comes to the usage of perfect. Um, and he uh, Kunzgar Borden also relates this to the fact that uh, typologically he relates that to the fact that uh, these languages do not distinguish adjectives from verbs. So how can we argue for this aspectual coercion further, and how can we prove that? Um, uh, that is exactly what is happening in Nafsan. So, according to Kunzikar Borden, um, in order to determine whether coercion is as such possible, uh, coercion from states into changes of states is possible in a language, um, we have to look at other contexts, so contexts other than perfect, where this also happens. And one such context is given in 10. And here in particular, uh, what I elicited from the speaker was um, the change of state with the, uh, with the verb, ang uh, in this case, the verb angry, um, and then especially coerced uh, with an adverb quickly, which means that if you say he, you could not say in English, he's angry quickly, right? Uh, so you have to get this, if that is possible in Napsan, if especially coercion into changes of states as such is possible, then we would expect it to be possible regardless of the tense aspect mood marking. So we would expect it to be also possible with general proclitics, and that is exactly the case uh, in example 10. So we can have something like teplaksok imait pelpel, the teacher got angry quickly in the context of the kids misbehaving. So we see here that the adverb itself can also coerce states, so it's, a pro it's the property of states that they are able to coerce into changes of state. And then in example 11, there is just one other context. So perfect is just one other context where this uh, coercion happens in Nafsan. Um, and below you can see the visualization of this. Um, so basically, uh, the meaning we get here uh, of perfect is again the same. It's the post time uh, of, of what is supposed to be a state, uh, but because we cannot imagine the states are homogeneous and they are not, they don't have post events because they would just continue to be, they would always be a state, right? So if you put perfect on top of the, on top of a state, um, if you're trying to compute the post time, you necessarily have to assume that there's some dynamic event here and that dynamic event uh, becomes a change of state. So that is the idea behind coercion. Um, 
The second principle that uh, can explain different behaviors of uh, perfect or different functions associated, uh, lacking or associated with perfect, um, are blocking principles. Um, so here in this semantic map, um, you can see um, the area in red uh, that represents uh, the functions of perfect available in Nafsan, to Abaita and Unua. Um, and in these languages, as you have already seen for Nafsan, we have the change of state meaning, resultative, anteriority, universal, and experiential, pretty much like English perfect, except for the change of state meaning. Um, and then there is one meaning that is available in English, but is not available in these languages um, with the markers that I studied, and that is the hot news uh, reading in blue. And this uh, reading, interestingly enough, in all these languages, uh, has um, another marker that is more or less specified for that meaning. So it doesn't mean that that marker only refers to hot news, maybe it refers to other things, but um, uh, it is dedicated. Uh, it is a dedicated marker specifically for that meaning. Uh, and um, basically the idea here is that whenever we have a more specific marker for one of the meanings, we do not expect it um, we, do not, we do not expect that meaning to also be covered by the more general um, category. So if perfect is already um, covering all this area and um, hot news would still be semantically compatible, so our analysis that I showed with the post time after the event, uh, that would be compatible with hot news reading. But given that we have this very specific marker in the language, uh, pragmatically, it wouldn't make sense for perfect to also be used in that um, in that context, or at least um, it um, it is better to use a more specific marker. So basically, these blocking principles mean that a more specific marker, like a hot news marker, blocks the availability of perfect for that specific meaning. And in Afsan, this is the case with the prospective marker, um, prospective realist marker po. Uh, that is always used for hot news meanings. Uh, so that's not the only of, of its meanings, and it might sound strange given that it's a prospective marker, but it also refers to realis events. Um, so that's really uh, its function in this context. Um, as an example of 12, Max uh, just come home, uh, Max has just come, uh, we have to use um, po in this context, and we cannot use uh, pe. Okay, so... Um, uh, interestingly enough, whenever we do not have, so the, the prediction of this, uh, of this uh, paradigmatic um, and pragmatic uh, principle is that when we don't have a specific marker, then we expect perfect to cover the area, the whole area uh, that, are, that is um, adequate, um, that is compatible with uh, the, its semantic definition, right? So in this context, in Maori, we can see that um, basically perfect does cover the whole area of so all the meanings we have seen so far plus uh, the hot news meaning um, that is uh, attested in English because there is no specific marker for that uh, reading. Okay, and the third uh, principle uh, that uh, explains some of the variability when it comes to already perfect and the additives and all that um, is the fact that some markers can simply be compatible with certain meanings, uh, even though their core semantic definition is different. And in this case, I will illustrate this with the um, case of perfective in Nafsan, uh, which is the marker su, and its core meaning is perfective, but it also co-occurs with perfect quite a lot. As you can see, hot news, resultative, universal, experiential, anteriority. Um, it does not occur with change of states, uh, naturally, because it's perfective. Um, and it was very tricky to figure out the semantics of this uh, marker, even for me, and Nick has already described it as perfective, but it was just so strange that it co-occurred with perfect so much that I also thought it might have had um, a meaning of already or something else, but I did some additional tests and um, confirmed that it must be perfective, more likely so than other meanings. Um, and uh, here are just a few examples where we see this combination of perfect and perfective. I have climbed the mountain, I have graded the taro. It might seem like um, uh, like we're dealing with a marker that is denoting that specific meaning of experiential or resultative, but in fact it's just combined with perfect. And this could also be the case with many markers that have been uh, hypothesized to be yamatives. They could just simply be in the context where their core semantic meaning um, is in a context compatible with that meaning. 
So the conclusion regarding the perfect is that um, based on this data that we have seen, uh, the additives do not seem to have an operational semantic definition, which would be needed if we wanted to use it um, as a cross-linguistic category. And that is because they're defined by this change of state meaning that is different from, per from perfect, but th this change of state meaning does not exist in these languages to the exclusion of other perfect, typical perfect meanings. Um, and also, as I have shown, a spectral coercion uh, can explain the presence of change of state. Paradigmatic blocking can explain the lack of certain perfect functions, even when we are dealing with a perfect um, category. And also compatibility in meaning can explain certain overlaps um, in distribution between perfect and already. Uh, and so that's, uh, with this we have come to realist and irrealist mood, part of this talk. Uh, and here the main question that I asked uh, was um, regarding the, the debate about the realist and irrealist, is realist irrealist distinction a meaningful cross-linguistic distinction or a category? And um, I came across um, Christophero's proposal, uh, which says that subject marking uh, can be semantically or morphologically distinguished from realis and irrealis, um, and it should not be classified as portmanteau markers, or at least we should be cautious about doing so. And so uh, I argue that one of these two categories um, are not necessarily semantically expressed by the subject markers uh, in a language that is analyzed uh, as having this distinction marked by portmanteau subject markers. Um, and so I show that that still does not invalidate the existence of this uh, category, and I argue that it is a, a valid uh, cross linguistic category. So the TMA interpretations of subject markers um, are, that are underspecified for mood um, are often derived from competition with a true portmanteau subject marker. And in this case, in Afsan, what I will be talking about is um, the underspecification of realis, which is then in competition with irrealis as a specified um, mood form. So just to get some definitions, uh, so this is the branching times model that has been adopted in our project um, in Berlin um, and has been developed by Kilo von Prince and Manfred Krivka uh, and based on Thomason. Um, so this uh, branching times model uh, has an assumption that basically in this uh, index that is context dependent, that would be our present time. And so from this present time, we can look back into the past. So this would be another world of the past that actually happened and another world in the past before that, that is also real. So these are the real worlds because they have the experience of uh, ha them having occurred. Uh, but then other worlds um, could spin off as parallel, uh, as branching worlds, as different kinds of possibilities. So when we look towards the future, so these will be the worlds of the future from the present moment, we can see two possibilities. But then from that point, there are more possibilities. There's two more, and then from that point, there's two more, and so on. It's like an infinite branching times uh, structure. So this will be the area of the future, um, of the future worlds. And then we also have these counterfactual worlds. Why? Because they they stem from the past. So there were possibilities in the past, but they have not, uh, they didn't happen, right? Because we know that this world happened. So these would be all the possibilities that ever existed uh, throughout the past. And this is uh, the future reference. And so Irrealis as a category uh, refers to all of these possibilities. So anything that is beyond the domain of non-actual worlds, so basically not present and um, not past, uh, everything that is uh, some kind of possibility that would be irrealist. Okay, so what is the problem exactly? What is the debate uh, about uh, when it comes to realis, irrealis? So irrealis is said to be polyfunctional um, because it denotes mood and modality, and it's often interrelated with other term categories, such as future tense, uh, as I said, right? So irrealis would cover the uh, cover this area of future tense. Uh, so in some languages you could cl claim that it's a tense if it only refers to the future, but if your language also includes other possibilities um, in the expression of that category, then you might say it's irrealis. And so this is a bit tricky how to distinguish when it's a tense and not. 
Um, and then the second problem regarding realis is that it is often found in modal contexts, so contexts that would actually be in the domain of irrealis, such as future, directives, and counterfactuals, which I will be talking about in the case of Nafsan. And just to give you an example from another oceanic language, because I will focus mainly on Nafsan in this um, uh, in this area. Um, so in Wogeo, we also have a realis and the realis uh, subject markers that attach as prefixes um, to the verb, and they can also be combined with other uh, TMA particles like this one, future. Uh, but then this is the problem, right? So we have future that combines with realis, but it also combines with irrealis. They're completely interchangeable. So that is one pro problematic aspect. And the second one is that realis actually has to be used with a counterfactual marker. Uh, so you have you cannot use irrealis even in this case. So in the um, in this counterfactual clause, you would use realis both in the protasis and in the apodosis of the conditional. So this is a problematic aspect that also ha happens in Nafsan. So we can see here again the subject proclitics. Um, we have the general uh, paradigm, the irrealis and perfect agreeing. And here I just wanted to show you how these, uh, although these proclitics might look compositional at a first glance, uh, it is really hard to synchronically have a meaningful morphological separation of uh, elements um, that would denote irrealis, for instance. So we had a, but then we have ka. But then in other persons, we have ta, tak. So k is not in the same place anymore. And then in one uh, case, in the second person singular, it's um, combined, so it'd be pa. And uh, really, there is no real good way of uh, separating them. So I regard them as synchronically not compositional uh, and actually being morphologically in, um, in a competition. And this is relevant for what I will say later about competition between general and irrealis uh, proclitics. So we can see here an example, a very basic example from the Nafsan grammar, uh, referring to the irrealis, for example, future, we won't eat, but we will stay uh, with irrealis proclitics, or yesterday evening we came to practice past reference with, um, with realis, or general proclitic. Um, and so here I just made a small um, diagram that shows more or less um, just how much uh, general proclitics and irrealis proclitics uh, overlap. So although we have mostly past and present reference with general proclitics, uh, they can still refer to potential uh, meanings, future contexts, counterfactual, habitual contexts, whereas irrealist proclitics also refer to all those contexts, but additionally they refer to relative future or just future imperative contexts and they are preferred in the ontic, um, in the ontic meanings, which is also a modal context. So, um, here we have a graph that shows um, different proportions or different distributions of uh, subject proclitics with different TMA markers. So, for instance, uh, the green one is perfect proclitic uh, or perfect agreeing. Then uh, the blue one is general or realis proclitic and the red is irrealis proclitic. And so we can see that we see a lot of blue, right? Uh, and that is not something that we would expect from a proclitic that is supposed to be uh, realis, um, especially because the markers that it appears with. So first it appears with perfect pe. It appears with the prospective realis po, well, exclusively with that one. Um, and then for the prospective irrealis, we also have a small number of occurrences with that. Uh, in counterfactual context, this is counterfactual conditional, we have half-half realis, realis. Um, and then fla might, we have mostly realis and then a bit of irrealis. Just to uh, give you an idea of the contexts that are really crucial for showing that general proclitics uh, do not denote realis, um, it's for example, even if we look at the cases where uh, the general proclitic occurs with perfect, uh, for instance here, uh, when you come back I will have finished writing the letter and here for the second part that has the future perfect reading, we use the general proclitic a with the perfect marker p. Um, and here, quite obviously, the, re the reference, the temporal reference is future, which should be incompatible with a realis marker. If you remember the diagram I showed um, of realis irrealis, right? Realis refers only to past and present, so the actual world uh, meanings, and would be incompatible with um, future readings. So in this case, really, what we see is that it 
th this proclitic does uh, show up in contexts that are clearly um, irrealis and related to possibilities. And this is also the case in conditional clauses. So here we have an example from a storyboard where we uh, elicited a very specific context where um, one, uh, two friends uh, were supposed to play volleyball the next day, but one of the um, uh, competitors hurt his finger, and so he's not planning to go to play um, uh, volleyball the day after. And he says, "If I play tomorrow, the sore cut on my finger will bleed again." So we see here this is a future context, uh, but it is at the same time counterfactual. Uh, and uh, this is the same sentence produced by two different speakers. One of them used the general proclitic in the process. Um, so, if I play tomorrow, afmer mas mato. So this is the the counterfactual uh, process. But the other speaker used the irrealis uh, proclitic in the same context, uh, cuff. So this is really going uh, going back to the this plot. Uh, this is basically this context, afmer. Right? We have half. Of the occurrences with uh, irrealis and half of the general proclitic. Um, and so what this tells us is that realis and irrealis um, or general proclitic and irrealis are quite interchangeable. How can we account for in general for the appearance of realis or the what was called realis in these non-actual contexts? So as I already mentioned many times, um, what I propose is that realis is really just person and number marking that is semantically unmarked for TMA values. And that um, the interchangeability can be accounted by, by the appearance of other modal markers. So in this case, we have the F marker, the F marker, and MER. MER is also a counterfactual marker. And the fact that realis or general prophetic attaches to this um, F uh, is already telling. It already tells you it's a conditional clause. And the MER after it says that it's the counterfactual meaning. So... Um, the general proclitic is not really doesn't need to do much here, okay? But then we still have irrealis sometimes occurring with it, or actually it is the pref uh, in some cases it's the preferred choice. Um, and in this case, what happens is that the irrealis just agrees with these markers and their modal features, um, as we would expect from its meaning. But then we come to an interesting question, and that is that if these um, general uh, proclitics or the so-called realis paradigm is not specified for TMA, how can you explain that the unmarked subject marking um, in the absence of any, any modal marking, so for instance, in the absence of the F conditional marker, it still has realis interpretations. So in most cases, when we just have a, a regular sentence with um, one general proclitic, we would usually have a past or present realis interpretation. So in this case, I argue that the realist meaning in sentences with past and present reference is derived by contrasting pragmatically uh, with the specified irrealis subject marking. So the fact that irrealis is specific, right? When we really want to say that something is just a possibility in the past or in the future, we would use irrealis. If we decide not to use irrealis, the assumption is that we probably want it to be less specific. And so we get the interpretation that the meaning we intended was past or present. And this is captured by Heim's um, uh, principle or maxim that she calls maximize presupposition. So make your contribution, uh, pragmatically right, presuppose as much as possible. So in this case, irrealis would be the category that has the presupposition of referring to irrealis events. And real, uh, the general proclitic would not have any presupposition uh, of that kind. And so you really want to use the one that is more specific whenever possible. And so if irrealis is required in the context, you would prefer to use irrealis. That's the basic idea. Okay, so what can, what can we conclude about this? Um, so in Nafsan and possibly other oceanic languages, I just hinted at uh, Wogeo, but there are other cases uh, very similar to this. Um, the forms other specified for TMA are often just subject, um, person, and number uh, markers. Um, so basically, uh, in many cases, we have this opposition between one category that is underspecified for TMA but marks the subject, and it contrasts uh, with this other category that is semantically stronger. Um, and so this uh, reals irreals distinction can arise as a consequence of this kind of pragmatic um, inference um, that is triggered by, compete, uh, by a competition between these two uh, categories. And to conclude overall, 
Um, the study of both perfect and realis and realis in Nafsan and in comparison with other Russianic languages, I think made contributions to both the semantics and typology of these two categories. Um, because uh, we found semantic explanations for additional functions or even the lack of functions associated with perfect. Um, and we showed that it is not necessary to postulate the new uh, Yamitip category. Uh, and regarding the realis irrealis, um, I try to argue that it is a valid linguistic category, even though um, it is not necessarily expressed uh, fully semantically, but uh, not both categories are equally expressed. Um, and uh, some of the debated features uh, can be resolved if we consider the possibility of semantic underspecification. Um, and also something I haven't actually talked about so much, but the fact that some of the meaning, some of the polyfunctionality of irrealis is due to its inherent meanings. For instance, future uh, being a part of irrealis um, semantic domain, basically. And then, of course, uh, depending on the linguist, you can choose to talk about future tense or irrealis mood, depending on, um, uh, yes, depending on how much weight you put um, into different functions that the category displays. And that would be all for now. Thank you. And uh, I'm waiting for your questions.